Number 11. Type 21 U-Boat Built by the Germans, the diesel-electric-powered Type 21 was the first submarine that was designed to operate primarily submerged, rather than as a surface vessel that could periodically go underwater for short periods to evade detection. Equipped with many more batteries than conventional submarines for the time, it was capable of submerging for several days at a time. When the Type 21 was underwater at length, it only came close to the surface to recharge through a snorkel. It featured numerous other improvements from previous subs, including nicer crew accommodation and an improved hull design which enabled greater underwater speed. But the submarine ultimately proved to be mechanically unreliable, vulnerable to damage in combat, and built in a hurry at inexperienced facilities. Production of the Type 21 started in 1944, and altogether 118 were built. But only four were actually combat ready, and only two were put into service during World War II. After the conflict ended, some of the subs were acquired by the navies of various countries, and several new submarine designs were at least partially based on the Type 21. Number 10. The Atomic Bomb Starting in 1942, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers led the development of the world's first nuclear weapon. Famously known as the Manhattan Project, the undertaking got its start due to fears that the Germans were developing similar technology. Research and tests were carried out at numerous sites throughout the U.S. and Canada, including in New Mexico, Tennessee, and Washington. The atomic bomb was designed based on the concept of nuclear fission, which is when the nucleus of an atom splits in two and releases an enormous amount of energy. In 1943, theoretical physicist and top nuclear fission researcher J. Robert Oppenheimer became the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in northern New Mexico. The first Manhattan Project bombs were built and tested there in 1943. Two years later, scientists executed the first successful detonation known as the Trinity Test. The atomic age had officially begun. Two different types of bombs, the uranium-based Little Boy and the plutonium-based Fat Man, were developed at Los Alamos. The Little Boy had not been tested when American forces dropped it on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, killing as many as 80,000 civilians. Three days went by without a declaration of surrender from Japan, prompting the U.S. military to drop the Fat Man bomb over the city of Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands more. The American government held a monopoly over nuclear energy until 1964, when President Lyndon B. Johnson began allowing private ownership of nuclear materials. Since then, nuclear fission technology has served as the basis for innovations in energy, medicine, and other non-combat-related industries. Number 9. Radar the earliest radar experiments were carried out during the late 19th century, but the first practical radar system wasn't produced until 1935. Developed by British physicist Sir Robert Watson Watt, the technology led to the establishment of a network of radar stations along England's eastern and southern coasts. This early radar system was designed with the hopes of transmitting beams of electromagnetic energy at enemy vehicles and harming their operators. It didn't work, but not all was lost. Developers realized that even if radar was useless as a weapon, it functioned well as a detection system. They worked to improve it while numerous other countries worked to develop radar systems of their own, including the U.S., the Soviet Union, Germany, and Japan. Radar advanced rapidly during World War II and is credited with playing a major role in securing an Allied victory. With its ability to detect enemy ships and planes, it proved to be a game-changer when it came to securing an upper hand in the conflict. After the war, radar technology was expanded for use in meteorology, civilian aviation, marine navigation, law enforcement, and medicine. Number 8. V-2 Rocket During World War II, the work of German rocket scientist Werner von Braun caught the attention of the Nazis, who summoned his help with designing the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. Over 3,000 of the Vergeltungswaffe II, or V-2 rocket, were launched against the Allies starting in September 1944. No effective defense existed against the missiles, which flew at supersonic speed, hit with little to no warning, and were more or less unstoppable in their paths. V-2 rockets were responsible for killing an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, as well as around 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners who were forced to help make the weapons. Allied forces made it a priority to seize production facilities and launch sites, as well as the V-2 technology itself, so that they could learn how the rockets were made. They were successful in their mission and also ended up capturing over 100 V-2 team members. Many of them, including von Braun, were among the 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians who were secretly moved to the United States and began working for the American government as part of Operation Paperclip. After the war, the Soviets occupied the V-2 manufacturing facilities and eventually moved production to the Soviet Union. 
According to Interesting Engineering, the five first-stage engines that von Braun designed for the rocket are the most powerful single-chamber liquid-fueled rocket engines ever made. Number 7. Jet Engines British Royal Air Force engineer Frank Whittle filed the first jet engine patent in 1930. Around the same time, German engineer Hans Joachim Pabst von Ohain was working on his own version of the technology. Germany became the first country to fly a jet engine plane just days before invading Poland in 1939, earning Ohain the distinction of being the designer of the first operational jet engine. Whittle's gas turbine engine powered the first British jet, which flew for the first time in 1941. Germany started preparing for World War II about a decade in advance, which could be partially why it beat England to flying the first jet-powered plane. England began ramping up its efforts to develop jet engine technology with the onset of the war, basing its first jets on Whittle's designs. The U.S. lagged behind both countries. Designed and built in 1943, the country's first jet fighter, the Lockheed P-80A, saw very limited service in Italy just before the war ended. The model was used far more extensively in the Korean War as the F-80. These fighter aircraft marked the beginning of a period in aviation history known as the Jet Age, which brought major changes to both the military and civilian worlds. Jet engines enabled planes to fly higher, faster, and farther than previous technology, making transcontinental travel more convenient than ever before. Number 6. Kabar Knife It wasn't long after the U.S. entered World War II that Army soldiers and Marines began complaining about the substandard World War I-era trench knives that had been issued to them. The weapon's grip was inefficient for hand-to-hand -hand combat and its blade was thin and prone to breakage even during ordinary tasks. In 1942, the Marine Corps authorized the development of a better knife that was more suited to the needs of soldiers who were fighting in the war. The Kabar Knife Company submitted a design for the improved fighting and utility knife. It was sturdy, easy to manufacture, and practical to use, and soon became the standard-issue knife among all U.S. military branches. After the war, the Kabar Knife remained popular. It was unofficially used in several ensuing conflicts, including the Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and Iraq Wars. Do you know anyone that has one of these knives? Let us know in the comments if you've ever seen one up close. Number 5. Pressurized Cabins Modern airplane cabins are pressurized, meaning air is pumped into them to mimic the atmosphere at sea level. This is necessary to prevent hypoxia, a dangerous condition resulting from the lack of oxygen at high altitudes. Built in 1938, the Boeing 307 Stratoliner was the first aircraft with a pressurized cabin. Only 10 were ever made. The first planes that were used in World War II were not pressurized, so pilots and crew members relied on bottled oxygen and wore masks. A need for pressurized cabins emerged as bomber aircraft became larger and required crew to move around. The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress was the first bomber with cabin pressurization, and it was equipped with the first mass-produced air pressure regulating system. Its fore and aft cabins were pressurized and connected by a tube that crew members could crawl through. There was also a separate pressurized compartment for the tail gunner, but it could only be accessed or exited at low altitudes that didn't require pressurization. Number 4. Enigma Machines During the war, the Nazis sent and received secret messages using a cipher device called an Enigma machine. Developed during the early to mid-20th century, the technology was incredibly secure protecting German commercial, military, and diplomatic communications from the prying eyes of the Allies. Correspondence was written in what was known as Enigma code. The machine's electromechanical rotor system scrambled the letters of the alphabet into a unique cipher code that proved extremely hard to crack. Polish mathematicians successfully decoded the system and shared the information with the British. In the meantime, the Germans worked to make the code more difficult to decipher. To make things even more secure, the device's settings were reset daily. Led by mathematician Alan Turing, a team of British cryptographers called Ultra helped break the Enigma code by developing an advanced machine that made the process much easier. Hundreds of thousands of Enigma machines were produced, but only a few hundred are known to exist today. Many were destroyed or thrown overboard shortly before the Nazis surrendered in 1945 in an effort to keep them from falling into Allied hands. Consequently, it's extremely rare for one to be discovered. Number 3 superior small arms. During the Civil War, both Union and Confederate forces struggled to work with the dozens of different ammunition sizes that were being used in combat. Between then and World War II, the U.S. made it a priority to improve this logistical nightmare, reducing its array of small arms to just three different calibers. Despite some improvements coming to these weapons, the delivery of proper ammunition remained a huge problem and came with a lot of confusion. This led to further post-war efforts to standardize both American and Allied ammunition. 
Additionally, the conflict saw the development of the first semi-automatic and assault rifles, including the self-loading American M1 Garand rifle, nicknamed the Yankee Self-Loader, and the German FG-42 and the Sturmgewehr 44. After the war, the United States incorporated elements of German machine gun technology into its M60 machine gun design. One of the most popular weapons of World War II was the American-made M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. Almost two million of the weapons were manufactured for soldiers fighting on land, in the air, and on the water. In addition to being incredibly versatile, the M2 was extremely powerful with its ability to fire 550 rounds per minute at a range of over four miles. Number two, aircraft carriers. Military pilots began landing airplanes on ships shortly before World War I when ordinary naval vessels were outfitted with landing strips. The first true purpose-built aircraft carriers were developed during the 1920s by the Japanese. But the technology really took off during World War II as many of the conflict's greatest battles were fought at sea. By 1941, the Japanese owned nine aircraft carriers. Each of their two largest ships were capable of launching at least 90 planes. Meanwhile, the British and the Americans developed comparably effective aircraft carriers that had a carrying capacity of 100 or more planes. Consequently, there were numerous clashes between Allied and Japanese carrier fleets. The earliest ships of this type often had a short airstrip, requiring the help of a catapulting device to get the planes in the air. But they were nevertheless highly effective. Aircraft carrier technology advanced rapidly throughout the war, and by 1945, aircraft carriers were the primary offensive naval weapon. Dozens were built in the U.S., but by the time some of them were finished, it was too late for them to play a major role in the war, causing several ships that were on order to be canceled. The conflict set the stage for the continued development of aircraft carriers, but only nine countries own them, and the U.S. and Britain are the only militaries that rely heavily on them today. There are currently 12 American and three British aircraft carriers. Number 1. Improved Tanks The first tanks were used at the end of World War I and in a very limited capacity. Between then and World War II, tank technology improved significantly. The vehicles became faster and more powerful and saw numerous other upgrades, including to their weaponry and track and suspension systems. Along with these improvements, the role that tanks played in combat grew. Numerous countries prioritized tank development, including the U.S., Germany, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France, just to name a few. At the war's outset, the U.S. relied on its light and maneuverable but poorly armored M2 series. It was replaced in 1942 by the much more popular M4 Sherman medium tank. Around 500,000 of the vehicles were produced between then and 1945, and they continued to be used long after the war ended. The M4 Sherman's replacement, known as the M26 Pershing, was the first heavy army tank. Its design represented a significant diversion from its predecessor, and it boasted major improvements in firepower, protection, and mobility. The M26 Pershing made its debut toward the end of the war and was used extensively in the Allied invasion of Germany as well as the Korean War. Number 9. Shipbreaking Yards Disposing of a large cargo vessel is a pretty complicated process, especially doing it properly and in a way that causes minimal waste and environmental damage. Most of the time, container ships are dismantled at shipbreaking yards in India and Bangladesh. The metal is scrapped and every usable and recyclable part of a ship, including doors and toilet seats, gets repurposed or reused. Sadly, there's a reason that most shipbreaking yards are in certain parts of the world. The work is dangerous and toxic, so the industry tends to set up shop in places with cheap labor and less restrictive environmental regulations. In a quest to offer an insider's perspective of what really goes on at these facilities, author William Langyavisha visited the Elang shipyard in Gujarat, India. He detailed his observations in his book, The Outlaw Sea, describing the site as a shoreline strewn with industrial debris on the oily Gulf of Cambrai in the Arabian Sea. Measuring roughly six miles long, the narrow, smoky industrial zone was lined with as many as 200 ships at one point. Each vessel was in a different stage of being dismantled and was spilling debris onto the tidal flats. Langyavisha described seeing emaciated workers among heavy soot and smoke, going dangerously close to a burning, unbearably loud and hot furnace. Multiple photographers, including Edward Bertinsky, have captured photos of the daily goings-on at sites like Alang. These sobering images show workers standing around campfires and toxic debris and the disassembled components of a ship they had taken apart. 
Even more troubling, the pictures reveal a stream of hazardous materials leaking into the sand and out to the sea. In the words of blogger Jeff Mana of Building Blog, the dismantled ships represent the scraps of a first world that sent its waste elsewhere. And he's not wrong. It's an undeniable characteristic among privileged countries to treat garbage as an out-of-sight, out-of-mind matter without lending additional thought to how it's handled or where it ends up. But sites like Alang are proof that, at the end of the day, someone pays the price for our first world wastefulness. Number 8. Thessaloniki Train Cemetery Outside Greece's second largest city, Thessaloniki, there's an ever-expanding collection of decommissioned trains left behind by the country's national railway. It's known as the Hellenic Railways Organization. The decaying cars began accumulating in the 1980s. Today, there are over 1,000 of them at the property. They attract lots of urban explorers, but serve no other purpose. The company tried to sell the cars as scrap several times, but these attempts were unsuccessful. Very few honest business owners seem interested in associating with the site, which has a reputation for scrap smuggling and other shady dealings. Not all the trains are worth scrapping anyway, according to some rail enthusiasts, who believe many of them should be preserved for their historic value. The yard contains some remarkable vintage cars, including antique wagons dating back to 1895, which once traveled back and forth between Thessaloniki and Istanbul. There are also vehicles that the Nazis seized as World War II trophies, according to photographer Nikki Panu, who spotted the ill-gotten cars during a visit to the site. On her website, Panu echoed the sentiments of many who think it's a shame that the vintage cars have been left to rot, unguarded, and at the mercy of vandals who have dismantled them and sold what they can for scrap. Describing the wagons as lost pieces of heritage, she further pointed out that it's unfortunately too late to save many of them. Number 7. Zugel Tank Cemetery in a small field just a few miles outside the German town of Zügel, there is a collection of around two dozen Leopard 1 and M47 patent tanks arranged in neat lines. Nobody seems to know why they're there, and although it's impossible not to notice the site, the German military is strangely secretive about it. Designed by Porsche, the Leopard 1 tank functioned as West Germany's main battle tank during the Cold War, when the country was split both physically and ideologically by the Berlin Wall. Nearly 6,500 of the vehicles were produced after it entered service in 1965. The Leopard 1 was a popular choice among European militaries for some time before the last of them were withdrawn from service in 2003 and replaced by the Leopard 2. Named after American World War II General George S. Patton, the M47 battle tank entered service in 1951. It was primarily used by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps, and you may be surprised to learn that it's the only American tank that the U.S. military has never used in combat. But the M47 has seen war under other countries' militaries, and some are still in operation today. While there's no physical barrier stopping curious explorers from investigating the tank graveyard, there is a strictly worded sign cautioning against trespassing and threatening legal action against violators. Some suspect that the property is an active military site and that helicopter pilots use the tanks for target practice, so it's probably best to obey the no trespassing sign. After all, better safe than sorry. Number 6. Czestochowa Train Graveyard Czestochowa is Poland's 13th most populated city. During the communist era, it was among the country's leading industrial and educational centers. Today, the city is popular among tourists and is still an industrial hub, thanks to the establishment of the Katowice Special Economic Zone, which offers incentives to business owners who set up shop there. But times nevertheless change, which is why Czestochowa is home to an abandoned train depot that has seen much busier days. During its heyday, the station served as a vital connection between the historic Warsaw-Vienna Railway and the rest of Europe. Over the years, six more rail stations opened throughout the city, and the depot closed because it was no longer needed. The disused property now functions as a storage facility for an eerie collection of aging rail cars that have been taken out of service. Czestochowa's landscape has changed considerably, but the city of 240,000 is still lively 
and has a lot going for it. It is here that crumbling remnants of the past coexist alongside the fast-paced day-to-day happenings of modern life. This could perhaps explain why urban explorers are tangled in a contentious debate over whether the station is a true train graveyard or a neglected part of a larger depot. Technicalities aside, the property is fascinating regardless, drawing many off-the-beaten-path explorers who are hoping to catch a first-hand glimpse of a bygone era. Would you like to check this place out? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 5. Excavator Graveyard When World War II ended, Germany was parceled out between Great Britain, France, the US, and the Soviet Union. A line was drawn splitting the country into the capitalist West and the communist East. Formerly known as the German Democratic Republic, East Germany fell under strict Soviet control. Separated from West Germany by the notorious Berlin Wall, the society was closed off from the free world. It wasn't until Germany reunified in 1990 that people from countries outside the Eastern Bloc were able to gain a first-hand glimpse into what went on during those dark, divided years. And while a lot of it was utterly depressing, some sites proved fascinating. Take, for example, a former East German coal mine located in the country's northeastern region. Known today as Ferropolis, it consists of five massive bucket excavators that were left behind when the site closed in 1991. The equipment was abandoned simply because it was easier and less expensive than moving or dismantling it. And while it might normally be a problem to leave such gargantuan garbage lying around with no future plans for it, the machinery attracted visitors. Today, the property functions as an open-air industrial museum. It's thought to be the world's biggest collection of deserted diggers, with each excavator weighing up to 2,000 tons. The site's oldest digger, nicknamed the Mosquito, was built in 1941. Running this 223 by 92 foot monster required between 3 and 5 operators. It took the same amount of people to run a 263 foot wide excavator known as Mad Max, which dates back to 1952. Both the Mosquito and Mad Max are small compared to the 328 foot long Medusa, which required 5 to 7 operators. But even the Medusa is dwarfed by the site's largest machine, the 410-foot-long Gemini. Built in 1958, the contraption was controlled by a 6-8 to eight person crew. The 102 by 246 foot big wheel is the newest digger. It was built in 1984 and requires 3-5 to five operators. Nobody has used the machine since mining closed, but they are legally protected and in 1995, the site officially reopened as Ferropolis, giving the public a chance to see the gigantic diggers up close. Number 4. Great Train Graveyard Near the mesmerizing salt flats of Uyuni, Bolivia, there's a collection of dozens of rusting locomotives and train cars. Known as the Great Train Graveyard or Cementerio de Trenes, the site is located on the outskirts of a deserted former transportation hub less than two miles from the modern local train station. During the early 19th century, plans were made to expand the region's train network. Sadly, the project was never completed. The local mining industry began to dry up and develop Developers encountered issues with other countries along the planned route. Meanwhile, they kept running into technical issues. Between bad timing, disagreements, and other problems, the project ground to a screeching halt, leaving more than 100 rail cars parked in the middle of the desert. Most of the vehicles were imported from Britain during the early 1900s. Thanks to vandalism and the region's salty winds, they're heavily rusted and rapidly deteriorating. The eerie train graveyard is open to the public and draws a heavy influx of visitors who stop by on their way to the salt flats. It's situated among a vast landscape completely devoid of homes, cars, and people for as far as the eye can see, serving as a constant reminder of how far from civilization it is. Number 3. Votsvijenka Aircraft Graveyard Located near the Sea of Japan in Russia's Far East, the former Soviet airbase at Vodzvizhenka dates at least as far back as the Cold War era. 
relatively little is known about the site, which is home to 18 or more gutted Tupolev Tu-22M supersonic bombers. In fact, it's the only former Soviet base east of the Ural Mountains that ever housed the Tu-22M. Nicknamed the Blinder, the aircraft entered service in 1962. It was the first ever supersonic bomber that was made in the USSR, but the plane underperformed compared to its manufacturer's expectations when it came to range and speed. The Tu-22M was produced in small batches, and it was difficult to fly and maintain. It was prone to crashing, pitching up, and striking its tail during landings. But it was still used in combat, and is actually one of the few Soviet bombers to ever see war. The Tu-22M served in the Iran-Iraq War and in skirmishes against Tanzania and Chad. Several countries invested in the aircraft for their own militaries, including Libya and Iraq, and many are still in service today. The bomber's golden era was nevertheless short-lived and the Tu-22M has fallen largely out of favor, leaving behind the seemingly post-apocalyptic rotting collection at Vodzvizhenka. Number 2. Abandoned World War II Machines Located in the Western Pacific, roughly 5,900 miles from the American mainland, Saipan is a commonwealth of the United States and the largest of the Mariana Islands. It's also the site of a brutal weeks-long battle between U.S. and Japanese forces that lasted from June 15 to July 9, 1944. Known as the Battle of Saipan, the skirmish ended with an American victory and the island's capture from the Japanese. There are numerous American and Japanese historical sites on Saipan. Several Sherman M4 tanks can be found off the shore of Chalankanoa Beach, sitting in about 10 feet of water. They're remarkably intact for their age and are a popular diving attraction among tourists. The island and its surrounding waters are also home to two sunken Japanese planes, two American planes, a handful of merchant ships, some landing vehicles, and other machinery. Divers could explore the submerged vehicles, including the Japanese naval ship Shouan Maru, which sits roughly 30 feet beneath the waves. Most of these attractions are available to entry-level divers. For more experienced visitors, there's an underwater pile of World War II-era junk filled with jeeps, airplane parts, and other items that the U.S. Navy discarded during its time in Saipan. Number 1. Chatillon Car Graveyard According to local legend, a forest near the Belgian village of Chatillon was once home to a massive collection of rusting cars. There are conflicting stories about where the vehicles came from. One tale claims that they belonged to American soldiers who were stationed in the region during World War II. When they returned home after the war, it would have been extremely costly for them to have the cars they bought overseas shipped to the U.S. So the troops drove their automobiles up a hill and into a forest, parked them neatly in rows, and simply left them behind. If this is true, then it means that none of the soldiers had second thoughts and missed their vehicle enough to retrieve it. It seems unlikely, and many locals are quick to point out that a lot of the cars were post-World War II models, indicating that the site was probably an ordinary junkyard. But it's hard to know for sure, since most of the vehicles have been removed. At one point in time, there were four car graveyards in the area, but this is no longer the case. Anything that was worth taking is gone, and the remaining cars are decaying and heavily rusted, leaving us with little to learn from about the property's past. 8. The Shipwreck of Panami. Greece's location between the Ionian and Aegean seas has made it a paradise for travelers looking to catch some rays on its iconic beaches. But being surrounded on both sides by the ocean also means the country is no stranger to shipwrecks. Just off the coast of Thessaloniki, a rusted cargo ship sits partially submerged where it sank in 1970. Even though the spot has become a popular one for divers, it also has a bit of a controversial past. The shipwreck of Epanami was once used to move soil from one shore to another, but with so many trips across the Thermaic Gulf, the ship did a lot of damage to the natural plants and animals there. The activity took place when a military dictatorship ruled the country, which could explain why there wasn't much thought put into protecting and preserving the wildlife in the area. Luckily, the activity eventually stopped, leaving the ship abandoned, where it turned to rust and sank into the shallow seabed. 
Thankfully, after the dictatorship fell, the area was designated a natural reserve. With so much attention on the natural beauty of the cove, it eventually became a popular place for divers who want to explore the vessel and the surrounding shallow waters. As visitors share their picture-perfect photos on social media, it's helped spread the word of this beautiful spot, allowing others to experience the beauty of the island. 7. The Sunken Igara Considered one of the most expensive shipwrecks, the Igara, an Italian ore carrier, sank in the South China Sea back in March of 1973. Shockingly, the $25 million ship was only in service for a year before it met its fate. It was packed with over 125,000 tons of iron ore when it set out on its journey from Brazil to Japan. But it wasn't exactly smooth sailing for the crew, who struck an uncharted rock about 190 miles 310 kilometers from Menderic Island. Even after hitting the rocks, the ship continued on its voyage, but as it neared Singapore, the ship began to sink. But the Agara wasn't a complete loss. Even though most of the ship sank, the stern stayed afloat. After using explosives to break away the entire back section, which also held the engine room, a salvage company salvaged part of the Agara so it could be reused in another ship. And the ship's cargo also didn't go to waste. The salvage company also managed to retrieve half the cargo of iron ore the ship had been carrying before it sank to the ocean floor. Even though it was an expensive loss, the ship has now become a haven for sea life. Strong currents sometimes make it a treacherous dive, but divers can't resist the corals, fish, and other underwater life that have taken up residence in what remains of the ship. 6. Greece's Most Famous Shipwreck on the northwest shore of Navagio Beach in Greece, the MV Panayotis crashed ashore in 1980. But it's the location of the wreck that seems to have captured the attention of visitors from around the world. Have you seen or heard of Shipwreck Beach? It's one of the most breathtaking places in Greece, a horseshoe-shaped cove with white sand and stunning blue waters. But amidst the beautiful landscape, there's something that might seem out of place, the rusted skeleton of the massive ship. Maybe it's the remote location that's inspired so many tales about the origin of the ship and how it ended up there. Some think it was, in fact, a smuggler's ship. Theories have surrounded the MV Panayotis since it was first discovered, with tales of smuggling and even human trafficking taking place on board until authorities caught up to it and surrounded it, causing the crew to panic and run aground. Another tall tale involves the ship's owner, Haris Kompatheklas, who was said to have been overtaken by a couple of Italian smugglers, who the man later imprisoned on board. When they came upon bad weather, Kompatheklas had to ground the ship in the bay, where he and his crew tried to salvage their cargo. Before they could get away with their goods, authorities caught up to the men, convicting them for smuggling and selling the cargo at auction. It all sounds exciting and romantic, but in recent years, the captain of the ship revealed what really led to the shipwreck. Bad weather and mechanical failures were to blame for sending the ship crashing on shore. After heading into town to inform the authorities, the captain realized they weren't going to be much help. The beach was inaccessible on foot, and they had no way of protecting it from looting. When the captain returned to his ship, he found a lot of equipment had been stolen. When Kompatheklas finally found a way to recover his ship, he was so stunned by the beautiful location where it sat that he decided to leave it there. How it became a tourist destination is a bit of a mystery, but in the days of social media hype, it's easy to see why travelers would want to visit this out-of-the-way monument and the incredibly pristine setting where it sits in the sun. Have you ever visited any of these shipwrecks in person? What did you think about them? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below, and be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe button if you haven't already. 5. The Discovery of a Decade in Portugal a time capsule to the height of Portugal's spice trade with Asia was found at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Located near the capital of Lisbon, the 400-year-old shipwreck was filled with spices, ceramics, and cannons engraved with Portugal's coat of arms. It was located about 12 meters, 40 feet deep, and experts think it landed there after sinking on a return trip from India sometime between 1575 and 1625. The discovery was an important one, with Chinese porcelain from the 16th and 17th centuries also found on board, offering experts a glimpse into trading during ancient times. A dredging operation at the mouth of the Tagus River unearthed the wreckage treasures, which also included cowrie shells once used as currency during the slave trade. 
The discovery was also proof of a long-held theory that the area was one of the richest in the world for shipwrecks. Its location near Portugal's capital city meant many ships came into and out of the port, which also means a lot of these ships ran into trouble and ended up sinking just off the coast. With the importance of the spice trade, many vessels had to travel through the Tagus estuary from India's southwest coast to deliver their goods. Local registries have records of at least 100 shipwrecks in the area, so this discovery could be the find experts need to continue searching for other historically important vessels on the ocean floor. Until then, the new discovery will remain where it was found, with experts carefully removing any important objects for study and preservation. 4. Disappearance of the Patriot Aaron Burr's daughter, Theodosia, was born just before the American colonies won their independence from the British crown. Her father was a lawyer and Patriot soldier, who later went on to become vice president. But the family was sent into a tailspin when Burr got into a duel with Alexander Hamilton, killing the famous politician in a story memorialized by the successful Broadway play. Burr eventually abandoned the US by fleeing to Europe. Married to the governor of South Carolina, Theodosia suffered more loss after her son died of malaria. Overwhelmed by the tragedy, Theodosia started suffering hallucinations. Hoping that sending her to New York would help, Theodosia's husband sent her on the Patriot, a schooner that set sail from South Carolina in December of 1812. But something mysterious happened to the ship, and it never made it to New York. The small crew, Theodosia included, vanished. The real story about the fate of the ship is still debated to this day. Some think it sank off the east coast a few days after setting sail when it encountered a string of brutal storms. But how can anyone be sure? As it turns out, the discovery of a haunting painting in Nags Head off the Outer Banks of North Carolina adds another piece to the puzzle. It looks strikingly similar to a painting Theodosia was said to have brought on board with her to present to her father in New York when they were finally reunited. With the painting's appearance in North Carolina, said to have been recovered from a shipwreck that washed ashore there, some now believe the Patriot never made it to New York and instead wrecked on the barrier islands. 3. Black Sea Discoveries a group of geologists surveying the Black Sea stumbled upon a surprising underwater graveyard in 2016. While marine biologists were there to uncover the hidden mysteries of the sea, they ended up locating 40 incredibly well-preserved shipwrecks, some that date back to the 15th and 16th centuries. Because the Black Sea only has a small connection to the Mediterranean Sea, the water there is sharply layered, with fresh water floating above the salty water below. This means the water at the seafloor has less oxygen, protecting the ships from any wood-eating organisms that might lurk there. The ships weren't necessarily a surprise, though. Other wrecks had been previously located there by marine explorers. To find so many ships in such great condition meant historians and researchers were in for a treat when they were finally able to get a closer look. They used special 3D photography to study the wrecks, building realistic models so they could get a better idea of what the ships looked like on the seafloor without disturbing or damaging them. Archaeologists are excited to finally get a look at these ships. Until then, the shipwrecks remain protected at the bottom of the Black Sea, just waiting to share their secrets. 2. The World Trade Center Ship It's not that strange for construction workers to uncover hidden treasures when excavating. But workers in New York didn't expect to uncover a historic 18th century ship 20 feet 6.09 meters under the World Trade Center site while preparing for a new building. Before construction could begin, experts first had to perform a basic search of the area to make sure there were no archaeological remains that would be destroyed during construction. That's when the thrilling discovery was made. They had found the historic ship, but how it got there is still up for debate. Most New Yorkers probably didn't realize that just below their feet, a historic ship lay buried for 200 years. The mysterious ship was originally believed to date back to the 1700s, but it took a group of scientists to uncover its true origin. After analyzing the remains of the ship, researchers were able to tell from the tree rings on the wood that the ship was made from white oak trees cut from an old growth forest around 1773 in the Philadelphia area. By comparing them to other wood samples from Independence Hall, they could tell that the growth rings matched those found in the wood of the World Trade Center ship, which meant the wood from both constructions came from the same area. Further research showed the ship was a Hudson River sloop that was designed by the Dutch to carry passengers and cargo over rocky water. 
Philadelphia was known as a shipbuilding hub during the colonial era, and the ship was built there and sailed for 20 to 30 years before it came to rest at the western shoreline of Lower Manhattan around 1818. There's also a possibility that a 100-pound, 45-kilogram anchor hidden in the same area could belong to the ship, and it wasn't the first anchor found while excavating in the area. When the foundation was being prepared for the Twin Towers, an old anchor and a Dutch cannon were also uncovered. The maritime relics survived for centuries underground and are now part of the National Maritime Historic Society in New York. 1. The Endurance more than a century after it was crushed by ice and sank to the floor of the Weddell Sea, polar explorer Ernest Shackleton's ship has been found. The Endurance set sail from South Georgia in an attempt to make the first land crossing of Antarctica, but after it sank, it would take over a hundred years to finally find the ship's remains. The 28-man crew set out on the Endurance in November of 1915, traveling across sea ice with the goal of reaching the South Pole and establishing a base on the Weddell Sea coast. Two days after leaving South Georgia, Endurance met its first ice field, taking several weeks to slowly make its way through the thick sea ice. When an ice floe closed in around them, the Endurance was frozen in place with nowhere to go and no way to break free from the sea's icy grip. They were so close to their landing place that it was a torturous place to be, and with the ice slowly pushing them away from their destination, the men had no choice but to stay where they were and get through the winter. Instead of simply sitting on the ship and waiting out the winter, they decided to try walking across the ice toward land, but after only making it 7.5 miles, 12 kilometers in seven days, they had no choice but to camp directly on the ice. Set adrift, the men inched further north, but when they finally saw the Elephant Islands come into view, hope returned. Sadly, months had passed and the weather was changing. The ice started to break up under them, battering them with icy water and damaging their ship. Sickness took hold, crippling some of the men, but they soldiered on and eventually rowed ashore. Their ordeal wasn't over though. The men realized that it was unlikely that anyone would come across to them on the remote island. So, a small group set out in lifeboats, and after a grueling journey, they made it to a whaling station. But that was just the beginning of the rescue mission. After one of the ships sent to retrieve the remaining crew members ran out of fuel, another couldn't handle the ice. A third ship was sent from Chile, and 128 days after the men set out for help, they were finally rescued. Miraculously, no one died, but the endurance didn't fare as well. After being crushed by ice, it sank to a depth of about 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters. In early March 2022, a three-masted sailing ship was located on the ocean floor more than a century after it sank. The 144-foot-long wooden wreck was still in remarkably good condition, and when the expedition sent down high-definition scanners, they saw that the ship's name was still clearly visible on the stern. Considering the harrowing journey by its crew and their remarkable tales of survival, being able to find this historic ship intact and so well-preserved is a testament to the ship, allowing it to live up to its name, the Endurance. Thanks for watching. Which one of these mysterious shipwrecks fascinated you the most? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Bye.